Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, joining us on our program this evening. My name is Gay Strandamo, and I am a librarian at Wanaki Public Library. And our program tonight is the first in a series called Uneasy Times. And Uneasy Times has been funded by Beyond the Page. Well, Beyond the Page, what is that? It is a permanent endowment held by the Madison Community Foundation that annually funds humanities programming for Dane County libraries. And I feel we're very lucky to uh, be in Dane County and have their support. Uh, our program tonight is about teaching in polarized times. And it's the challenges of teaching for democracy in a climate of political uh, climate change. And our uh, speaker tonight is uh, Dean Diana Hess. And she served as a dean for at UW Madison School of Education since 2015. And under her leadership, the school has experienced notable growth, including the development of two new undergraduate majors and several popular certificate programs. The school has also established the new initiatives focused on strengthening and expanding its efforts around teacher education, diversity, and inclusion, and global engagement, professional learning, and community partnerships. Good things all. So here is Diana House. Um, I must say uh, she would like you to um, use the chat for questions at the end of her program. So. Let's start now. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's an honor to talk with you tonight. I'm gonna to share my screen. And tonight I'm talking about the challenges of teaching for democracy in a time of political climate change. So I wanna start by saying that we are living in a time of political climate change. And let me explain what I mean by that. When scientists talk about climate, they refer to the average daily weather for an extended period of time in a certain location. So people who live in Madison and Wanakee, for example, know that we need to own warm coats uh, for winter because um, it gets very cold. And that's what we mean by climate. Um, of course, we also know that we should look outside every day and check the news to find out what the short-term conditions are. Is it sunny? Did it snow today? Is it raining? And that is weather. So one way to think about it is climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And similarly, when I speak about um, the political climate, I'm referring to the aggregate mood and opinions of a political society over time. It's how we expect people will think and behave in our democracy based on long-term study and observation. So political weather refers to short-term events like elections, uh, campaigns, debates, etc. But political climate, like climate is to weather, is larger and is more important and has more impact. And what I'm going to argue tonight is that because of political climate change, one of the historic reasons that we have schools in the United States, which is to prepare young people to participate politically and civically in a democracy is much more challenging. So to begin, why don't we go back for just a moment and look at um, climate change. So as you're looking at this map, you can see over time how the climate is changing you know, obviously very dramatic. And in a similar fashion, um, I'm gonna talk about a political climate change. And I'm gonna begin by talking about kind of two things that have combined to create political climate change. One is the tendency of people in the United States to now live close to other people who have similar political views. So this phenomenon, which is called the big sort, um, is described, I think, quite brilliantly in this book by Bill Bishop. And I would really encourage you to take a look at it. So what Bill Bishop argues is that 
in the last 30 years, the tendency for Americans to be more interested in living close to people who have similar political beliefs is actually influencing the political climate. Specifically, it's one of the reasons that we have so much political polarization. So let's talk a little bit about how what political polarization looks like. And what I wanna show you kind of similarly to what we saw with uh, climate change is what the United States looks like in terms of political polarization. So I'm gonna take us back to 1992. And what you're seeing on this map is counties that are either blue, which means they're predominantly Democratic, or red, which means they're predominantly Republican. If they're light blue or kind of pink, they're less predominantly, but still they lean Democratic or Republican. And all the things that don't have blue or red are counties in which there's a lot of political diversity. So this is not that long ago. And I think what you notice when you look at the map is that we certainly have some red areas and some blue areas, but most areas are not red or blue. So let's look about at what happens over time. So this is four years later, as you can see, becoming more red, more blue. Here's 2000, dramatic change, 2004, eight, 12, and finally 16. And I think that change is incredibly dramatic. And what that illustrates is that more people are likely to live in a county that is uh, swinging one way or another. Another way to uh, put it is by looking at um, landslide voting. So this is the 2016 presidential election. And all the areas that are red are areas in which more than 70% of the people who voted voted for the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, and blue voted for the Democratic candidate, of course, Hillary Clinton. And that few areas that are purple are areas where there was more of a mix. In other words, it wasn't a landslide county. Now, of course, what's interesting about this map is that if you look at it, it seems incredibly weird given what we know about the country as a whole politically. So, you know, most people would look at this map and say, well, the United States is predominantly a Republican or red country. But we know that's not the case. Just think back to how close our national elections have been. And the reason for this, of course, is that when you correct for population, which is what I'm going to do now, we see um, that, in fact, um, you know, the, the country is, is about a 50-50 a, a split. And the, with people who are Republican tending to live in more rural areas, obviously these blue areas tend to be, you know, big cities for the most part. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is that if people are living in an area that is predominantly red, predominantly blue, they're more likely to become strong partisans. Because if you live close to people who agree with you politically, you're more likely to swing partisan. Now in the back, or in the, if you look back to 1952, 1960 here, you can see that there, there was a difference between how partisanship affected whether people participated in voting but that difference has become much more pronounced over time. So one of the things that um, this is causing is what political scientists and psychologists cause, call affective polarization. So this is the attitude that people have that there's actually something that's uh, wrong with the other political party, the party that's different or the parties that are different than the one that they might um, tend to support more often. So let's look at this over time. And what you can see is that going back to 1994, again, not all that long ago, there were you know pretty small percentages of people who had a very unfavorable attitude about the political party that was different than the one that they affiliated with. And of course, that is increasing dramatically over time. Another question 
was whether or not the other political party is literally a threat to the nation's well-being. And you can see here that the number of people who think that's the case is, is really quite high. So, so what does that mean? Well, there's been a lot of research about the relationship between living in a politically diverse community, tolerance for people who are different, have different views than your own, and participation. And one of the books that I think does a really great job explaining this is a book called Hearing the Other Side by Diana Mutz. And what she finds in her research is that people who live in a politically diverse community, now think back to the map we saw, that's not a whole lot of people, but obviously some people are living in a politically diverse community. An example in Wisconsin would be Green Bay, which is one of the, the most purple, which means the most politically diverse parts of, of the state. So people in politically diverse communities tend to be more tolerant of people with different political views, but tend to participate politically at rates lower than, as you can see here, people who are living in a what she calls politically like-minded community, which causes people to be more likely to participate, but actually decreases their tolerance for difference. So that produces this, I think, very strange and disturbing phenomenon where we have people who are most uh, tolerant are least likely to participate. People who are least tolerant are more likely to participate. So if um, you've been watching what's been going on in American politics for the last many years and how polarized and how highly uncivil we see political discourse, one of the reasons for that, according to the research done by Diana Mutz and others, is this um, phenomenon of how where you live and who you're, you're, you're being exposed to influences whether you participate. So what does that have to do with teaching or with schools? Just this past Saturday, um, the School of Education here at UW-Madison sponsored a conference called Teaching About the Elections for teachers from uh, K through 12. And we had about 200 teachers there. Almost all were from Wisconsin. But because this year the conference was virtual, we had some teachers from other parts of the United States as well. And part of the swag that teachers who attended this conference virtually will receive is a t-shirt that on the front has this very simple saying, teach like democracy depends on it. And what I'd like to do for the next several minutes is kind of explain to you the relationship between certain things that we can do in schools and the likelihood that young people will be more likely to participate politically. And then I also want to illustrate for you how political polarization in communities affects, not surprisingly, what we see in schools. So let me real quickly tell you about a study that I did with my colleague Paula McAvoy a number of years ago. And the research questions um, were, were pretty simple. The first thing we were interested in is what happens in classes, high school classes, where teachers are teaching young people how to talk about actual controversial political issues, the political issues of the day that create um, a lot of, of debate and are highly authentic. And we were interested in whether participating in those kinds of discussions and deliberations affected students' political and civic participation after high school. And then we were really interested in how teachers thought about some of the ethical challenges that they encounter when teaching um, about uh, civic education, when teaching about controversial political issues. So for example, one is a uh, classic, should teachers share their own views about political issues with students. So we were really interested in how teachers thought about those um, ethical issues. And to do this study, we were in three states. So as you can see, we were in Wisconsin, which was at the time and still is what is considered a purple state. It is probably the, at this point, the most purple state in the United States. And we were in Indiana, which at the time and still is a very red state. And we were in Illinois, which was then and still is 
a more blue state. Now, of course, there's a lot of political diversity in all three of these states. So just because they overall look one way or another doesn't mean that there are a lot of communities with a lot of difference. So what we did is we went into uh, 21 schools, all um, high schools, public schools, private schools, some were religious schools, some were in small towns, some were in suburbs, some were in larger oh, cities. And we um, studied what teachers were doing and studied the teachers, okay. students in their classes. So as you can see, uh -huh. we had about a thousand students or so. And one of the things that we realized is that the classes looked fairly similar to the communities in which the schools were based. So here is a class that is outside of a big city in Illinois. It's, it's out in the kind of far suburbs. And we asked students all sorts of questions to get a sense of their political views. This was a, a very politically mixed or very diverse community. And in addition to asking the students who they would have voted for had they been eligible to vote in, as you can see, this was uh, quite some time ago that the, uh, oops, I'm sorry, my slide is messed up. Um, for some reason that's not coming out. Um, well, you can, well, I guess you can see it pretty clearly here where they were, they were quite mixed in terms of who they said they would have voted for. And then um, we also ask them a lot of questions about their political views. So here we are in another class. This is in a community in Wisconsin that is a very, very blue community. And as you can see, when you look at this map, that almost all the students had political views that swung very progressive as evidenced by the fact that they're you know, filled in blue. There are some students who were undecided about issues. That's what you see the gray here. And some students who were had conservative views on issues. And now we see Mrs. Heller's class. And you can see the difference between that very blue class and this purple class where there's just a lot of political diversity. And then we were in a third class um, in a religious school, Mr. Walter's class. And as you can see, that for the most part was a fairly red class. Well, this was kind of the case in all these classes that we were in, is that the, there, there was in some classes a lot of political diversity and in other classes less so. And what we noticed in the study is that the difference uh, of what teachers had to do in these classes to get high quality discussion was really dramatic. So kind of in a nutshell, in Ms. Heller's class, where there was a lot of authentically occurring political difference, it was pretty easy to get high quality discussion on controversial political issues because it was easy for the students to be exposed to views that were different from their own. And Ms. Heller was an excellent teacher and was very good at teaching students how to be highly civil with one another when they talked. In these other two classes, it was more difficult because as you can imagine, there was more agreement in the class and all of these teachers were interested in exposing students to differing points of view. So one of the things that we learned in the study is that what teachers need to do in schools is heavily influenced by the political diversity in their community because the political diversity of young people is not gonna track absolutely what adults in the community think for sure, but it's going to be strongly correlated. So one of the challenges that we encountered when we were talking to teachers and doing this research is we know that we need to teach young people how to participate politically in this highly partisan environment. And we also know from what I showed you before that the more partisan people are, the more likely they are to participate. And yet we expect schools, rightfully so, to be nonpartisan spaces. You know, we would hate to have a school that was a Republican school or a, a Democratic school or a Green school or whatever. And so one of the challenges that teachers have, especially in this time of polarization and partisanship, is they have to figure out how to kind of deal with this paradox how to, on the one hand, make schools 
nonpartisan places where students can learn what they need to learn to participate politically at the same time that they're preparing them to do that in a highly uh, partisan environment. And what we learned um, is that when teachers focus on teaching kids about controversial political issues. And what would I mean by that? Well, so an example would be, should we have a system of national health care? That would be a, a controversial political issue. Here in Madison, we have two school referenda on the ballot coming up. Those would be local controversial political issues. So generally what we know from research is that when young people are taught how to talk about highly controversial political issues in a way that's really high quality, it has a lot of very um, specific effects. And I've, you can see these listed on the, on the slide. One thing is we know that young people, if these discussions are done well, tend to be highly engaged in them. That it's much more interesting for young people to learn about the political world in which they live if they're actually dealing with the real issues of the day that in, in the process of learning about these issues, young people learn really important content about the political system. And that even though, as I showed you before, schools can mirror to some extent the uh, ideological makeup of their community, schools are more diverse public spaces for students to have these kinds of discussions than they would encounter, for example, in their homes or in other venues in which they spend a lot of time. And the diversity of political opinion is kind of the mother's milk of deliberation. That if you wanna teach people how to talk about highly controversial political issues in a way that both builds tolerance and influences the likelihood that they'll politically engage, that, that really is dependent on people being exposed to multiple and competing views. So what we found in these classrooms where teachers were doing this really, really well is that they tended to have discussions where students had to do a lot of advanced participation. There was a lot of student to student talk. Everything was not being mediated uh, by the teacher. Very high levels of participation and a very intense focus on these controversial political issues. And when we studied these students after high school. So we followed these students two and four years out after high school. And what we learned is that the students who were in these high quality classes, and we called them best practice classes, were um, much more likely to uh, talk about politics. They were much more likely to be interested in politics and follow the news. They were much more likely to um, say that they intended to vote in the future, and when they got old enough, much more likely to report that they actually did vote. So what we saw is that this kind of approach to teaching young people about democracy was, was highly effective. Um, that being said, we also realized then, and it's even more significant now, that it's extremely difficult for teachers to do this kind of teaching in an environment that is this polarized. And one of the reasons for it is that oftentimes parents and other adults in the community are kind of leery about young people hearing points of view that are different than the point of view that um, might be favored by the parents or might be the majority point of view in, in the community. And uh, that leeriness um, puts pressure on teachers. So what we've seen and what we heard last week, for example, at this teaching about the elections conference is that if teachers are going to do this and do it well, they need to have a lot of support. They need to have administrators who, who really um, want them to teach this way. And they need to explain very carefully to parents what they're doing and why. And they need to make it clear that what they're not doing is to try to influence their students to have a particular point of view. What they're trying to influence their students to do and to want to, uh, to grow in is to have views and to have an interest in the political system. Because as a general rule of thumb, what we find is that people are more likely to participate 
um, the more familiar they are with how the political system works. So in a nutshell, let me end by saying that um, teaching uh, about democracy in a time of political climate change is more difficult now than it was in the past, in part because what we see in the world outside of school influences the world inside of school. But as these almost 200 teachers we talked with last week at this conference explained to us is that they believed that even though it was harder, it was more important than ever because they were increasingly concerned about the pretty clear dysfunction we have in our contemporary political system. And those of you who watched the debates last night, I think got you know, quite a bit of evidence of that. And so I think what teachers who are interested in teaching about democracy and teaching for democracy uh, want to do is to see if they can do things in schools that will make it more likely that we have a generation that will, will want to uh, both participate and do it in a way that is not quite so uh, charged, so divisive, so uncivil. So let me go back to that t-shirt for a moment. Um, on the front of it, it says, teaching like democracy depends on it. And on the back, it says, because it does. And with that, I will um, stop sharing my slides. Um, let me thank you so much for um, participating uh, by listening to this tonight. I know that the Wanakee Public Library is planning on making this and the other talks that are part of this series available to the pub public. And I, I think that's terrific. And I want to thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Take care and have a good evening.